what you're looking at is a negative space screensaver. It's the max default Cosmos screensaver <coughs> and uh, that I inverted. <laughs> so I'm going to start showing you some work and talking about it. Um, I grew up in California and I went to uh, UCLA for my master's. I graduated in 2000. Um, prior to that, I lived in New York City for like the middle chunk of the 90s. And um, I did a thing called the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program and uh, kind of started showing in sort of small galleries and stuff. And I wanted to start with a couple projects that sort of make a good bookend with what's on view here at the Hammer right now. Um, excuse me. The, um, so a lot of the work that I was doing in New York was, you know, gallery objects that sort of looked more or less like paintings, in quotes. And in fact, I was admitted to the painting program at UCLA at, the, at first. <clears throat> but uh, so it was things like maps and um, signage and things like that, all the sort of drawn from sort of public space, social space, and put in the gallery and sort of re altered in some way, recontextualized in some way. Um, and then I started coming out to LA, and a piece that sort of bridges that is this. Um, there's a bunch of these, these star maps, and these are the, you know, when you're driving on Sunset and you, they, they're selling star maps, um, which are guides to the homes of the celebrities. So these are those with that are inked out except for the stars and now you have this sort of new new sets of constellations that are actually neighborhoods where movie stars live um, and that was sort of a product of my coming out here to scout and think about going to school so the first thing I did when I was uh, in graduate school at UCLA more or less the first thing was um, a project like this. I was sort of, this is a piece called Room Tone, and it's an audio work. And um, I had been thinking about how, you know, how interested I was in social space and public space and these kinds of um, <clears throat> the sort of dynamics of that kind of space, um, networks and systems, and how things travel and get distributed, and all this kind of stuff. And um, I was becoming less interested in the gallery being the destination for all this energy. I was starting to think about how maybe it could be a launch pad, like you could take it out from there. And that went for the studio as well. And I was reading a lot of Daniel Buren and stuff, and this was a very Buren-oriented uh, work. I actually don't need this light if you want to turn it off. Um, thanks. <clears throat> So when I got to UCLA, uh, this was my studio. And I mic'd it and made a recording of the empty studio. And this is a technique that's used in Hollywood when they um, shoot dramatic scenes. They, you know, the people are standing in there, and they have a conversation. And everyone stands still, or they empty the room out. And they record the atmosphere of the room, because it's not the same as empty tape or silence or you know, every room has a signature, it's called. So I sort of did that minus the dramatic scene and made a recording of my, the signature of my studio. And then that object could travel like an artwork. It could go, you could play it in your car, you could play it in your home, and you could, in that way, superimpose the atmosphere of my studio onto your, onto another space. And, um, so I was really thinking about the sort of the basics of production and reception, and what are the what is the sort of basic, really fundamental algebra of um, art making, and the the site of the studio, and the exhibition space, and the collector's home, and all these kinds of like places that things go, and how those contexts change the work. So this is I was sort of trying to. 
my, my time at school was kind of spent educating myself about that stuff and, make, and doing experiments. So, I started making my own graph paper um, as another sort of gesture towards this very basic, like, what is, what is, it, what is the substrate of a practice? And I made these with the intention of using them as backgrounds to draw on, <clears throat> and then I just couldn't bear to because they were so much work. And uh, they were a total, they were very wrong-headed because they're very hard to photograph. They're made with non-photo blue ink. They're really quite beautiful in person, but you can't, you know, they don't travel. <laughs> so I started giving them to other artists to draw on. And that was my, that was another thing that kind of happened in, in school was um, working with some of my fellow students and like giving them this to do what they wanted on. Um, another thing that happened was I went to a collector's house who had my work and had this kind of revelation that I should just make wind chimes for rich people's houses. Um, it was really, I, I felt like it was this combination of decor and status that constituted desirability for a work and I just wanted to do decor that had no status and um, that was the sort of the initial hostile gesture that led to this whole series of wind chimes that I made myself by hand and um, but I became really interested in the other issues that uh, came out of that like um, you know, if you, like the economy of the object, if you can, how, like the graph paper, like the room tone piece, like how little can you do and still have it be a work? So an empty room is an empty room. If you hang a wind chime in it, it's not anymore. The entire space is activated as a kind of atmospheric contemplative space. And I was sort of interested in just the tininess of that gesture. And then as I started showing them and they started to be activated by the audience itself physically, like the door opening, people walking past them, touching them, whatever, then it became really clear that all these issues of audience and reception were literally being embodied by this, by those projects. So um, <clears throat> I made a 12-step bumper sticker based on the Bruce Nauman phrase from 67, the true artist helps the world by revealing mystic truths. This was a modeled on these easy does it one day at a time stickers that are all over LA or they were then anyway and uh, I was really interested in them I didn't know what they were they sort of seemed to suggest some hidden knowledge some like um, subculture that I wasn't privy to and I started researching and found out they were recovery organization slogans and I made one for um, the Nauman phrase and it was obviously rather than this long, it was three feet wide. And I started giving it to other artists. And this is the parking lot at Warner, um, circa 1999. And these, um, I had one on my car. And people would honk at me and talk to me and yell at me and stuff like that. And I became very non-anonymous non and non-neutral in this interesting way that I mean, it was uncomfortable. But I became very interested in this idea that the work could have a life outside the sort of standard um, exhibition system. Then I made this work called The Collected Live of Recordings of Bob Dylan, 1963-1995. This was a, the title is a play on Stephen Prina's complete works of Edward Manet. And uh, this, oh, can you play this, the Bob Dylan piece? Audio? This is a 25 minute. This is called Talking John Birch Blues. <laughs> A 25 minute CD. I'll let you hear. And there ain't nothing wrong with this song. <laughs> so 
So considering all these issues of audience and stuff that I was thinking about, <clears throat> I, I made this project. It's an audio recording of all of the applause from all of Bob Dylan's live records during these years. And because of the way the sticker had functioned, I, I, I didn't even know how to exhibit this as an artwork. <clears throat> I've since figured it out, but um, so I sent it to radio stations and record stores and things like that. And um, they started getting played on the radio in LA on KXLU and KCW. And it even went into the top 30 on um, KXLU. And um, in the And um, it moved. I made a poster for it, and I sent it to the radio station that I sent the DSK2 poster. And then, when I did an exhibition, I did bus coaches around LA. Uh, you can turn down a little. Um, I lived at La Brea and um, Pico, and all the new hip hop TVs were always advertised right there on the benches. And um, I've always really liked these kind of down market sites, kind of like the 12 step sticker. It's, there's something a little bit depressing about it, but it's um, there's something rich there, and it's cheap. This is Pico and La Brea, in fact. Um, <laughs> the piece begins with a band performance on Ed Sullivan in 1963 and ends on MTV Unplugged in 1995 with a very warm welcome. And it sort of charts in between the, you know, changes in recording technology, changes in the size of venue, the size of the audience, um, hostility from the audience. Um, in a minute, you're going to hear the crowd yell Judas at him, which is coming up, uh, when he first played Electric, and then later it's like, lay, lady, lay, like shouting requests and stuff like that. So it's kind of this um, march to mass culture is how I think it. And there have been a number of public uh, projects alongside the exhibition of this work. So this is San Francisco in 2002. And in 2004, I made a five-year anniversary poster for the piece with his crates containing all the electric instruments that upset everyone, and all the cities I had shown it, that I had shown this piece at that time. And this is what a room with it playing in it looks like. Usually empty with speakers, sometimes posters. This is in Belgium. And this is Paris last year. And this time there was no posters, just a graphic on the window that was uh, white with the text cut out. It's all over time and over the moment. Time and move. Wait, final. Time and move. 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 Time and it consisted of the Dylan project and the bus benches and these wind chimes in the gallery. And this this was my thesis project that I graduated from UCLA with. It was a, um, you, know, you have to do a written thesis in the MFA. So I made a comic book, which was modeled on Chick tracks. Jack Chick is the they're, okay. They're these little born again Christian evangelical um, comic books that are like 24 pages long and they're basically, you're going to hell. 
and um, they're really amazing, economical, beautiful things that are really effective. They convert people all the time, and um, they're also a little bit uncomfortable. The art is usually kind of bad, and the um, if you're not a believer, <laughs> it's just kind of awkward. And uh, I but I, I really always like them, and so. I had, meanwhile, while in school, kept a journal in my studio of like, you know, day to day of like working. If I didn't feel like working, I would write. And usually I would only write if I was depressed about how things were going in the studio. So I, when I was getting ready to graduate and thinking about writing something, I went through this thing and saw how sort of gripey it was and how it kind of, if you abstracted it a little bit, it started to sound like a religious diary. So I sort of flagged everything that sounded like it could be talking about faith when it was talking about art and um, there's also a Spanish translation of this comic out there um, and I turned it into and I drew a bunch of this apocalyptic kind of cosmic slash mundane imagery and paired it with excerpts from my studio journal so it was just kind of ups and downs of the studio practice and then I took the comic to the airport and left it for people to find. When I was, so now I'm finishing school, and this is, um, I had a ruler made. I, I was making all that graph paper with the six foot ruler in my studio, and the graph paper was always out of scale, intentionally. And I realized I needed to make a six foot ruler um, <coughs> to sort of complete the project and uh, so this was a this is an object that is kind of important for me because you when you're standing it's a six foot ruler that's been scaled to my to my foot so it's slightly shy of 72 inches it's about 66 inches or something and you only know that standing in front of it depending on your sense of scale and otherwise you're just looking at an, an object that you know could just be a ready-made or whatever and something about that that was exciting to me and I played with sense like this idea that your perception your judgment is entirely the crux of the meaning the detail Following that, I um, was in the studio after the show, and um, it was beginning to become clear to me that art was now my job that I had studied and trained for and paid for a degree in and all these kinds of things. So, but I had done a show, and now I didn't really know what to do with myself. And uh, so I felt like I had a job, and. I was biding my time waiting to have an idea or something. And I was effectively like throwing pencils at the ceiling in the classic office shtick. So I uh, manufactured a dozen pencils and stuck them in the ceiling. That's my old studio. And um, this is a piece called Between Projects. Then went on a residency to Rotterdam in 2001, and um, did a number of things there. But <coughs> one thing that I did was I discovered this glass factory outside of Rotterdam, where they sort of world-renowned crystal, handmade crystal artisans, you know, 150-year-old tradition of hand-blowing lead crystal. On the other side of the factory. There's a machine press making 100,000 Heineken bottles per day. And these guys, I went in and met with them, and they, they're making like the Queen's wine glasses and so on. And I gave them a Heineken bottle and asked them to make crystal versions. So these are hand-blown lead crystal Heineken bottles made in Holland. And um, I show them as flower vases and um, candle holders. 
the beer bottle camel holder, this is the initial exhibition in, in Rotterdam. Um, they following all this sort of Dylan and, and wind chimes. I was interested in producing more works that generate atmosphere for the space, but also in summoning some of this this idea of counterculture and like the, the beer bottle candle holder in the dorm room and clubs and stuff like that. And I wanted to bring some of that sort of concentrate conspiracy theory. I wanted to bring all that kind of into the space around these things. And um, and the candles just melt down over the exhibition. And then there's some in the office where at the lunch table. And they just sort of they have a, a degree of practical usage. And this is an exhibition in LA in 2002. And then I did this piece called The American Desert for Chuck Jones, um, which was a video of only backgrounds from Roadrunner cartoons. So it's um, no coyote, no Roadrunner, just the cartoon desert. You can hear the sound is getting louder in state. He's playing in stadiums now. It's the 70s or the 80s or something. You can um, turn the Dylan off if you want. Silence. Um, this was a sort of a follow-up to the Dylan piece in some respects. I was also interested in the desert as this place where you go for your vision quest or your acid trip or your, you know... Um, your getaway, your sort of escape to the wasteland beyond civilization and um, culture rarely intrudes. It does occasionally with trains and garbage and stuff, but culverts. But mostly it's just um, this sort of fantastical, psychedelic version of the desert, which is a mashup of all the existing deserts, um, which are, um, that is American deserts, like Joshua Tree's in there, Monument Valley's in there, Natural Bridges is in there. They're all sort of one place, one imaginary platonic desert. <coughs> and in 2002, uh, I finished it, and Chuck Jones died right around then. And so I named it for him. And... Um, I screened it in the desert at Andrew Zettel's um, High Desert Test Sites, which is in Joshua Tree, and it was out of doors at night. Hay bales for seating. This is a piece called Sentences on Conceptual Art. So after Chuck Jones stopped doing the Roadrunner, other people started directing the same cartoons, and they forgot all these rules that he had, which I thought were great. Um, speaking of old conceptual artists, this is a piece called Antenna Baldessari. It's, uh, John was my teacher here at UCLA, and um, he was also a teacher for many years at CalArts, and he has so many sort of Disciples. He kind of has an army, and I thought that since like the Dodgers and Jack in the Box have an army, like he should have an army. So this is sort of a follow-up to the Nauman sticker. This I wanted to include because this was like <laughs> essentially my first monograph, you might say. Um, and this is like a cheaply printed little book based on desert guides. Um, I did this with Matthew Higgs. He wrote the text, and I made these drawings of my work. Because in those books, it's always like a drawing of a lizard, and then the, you know, its habitat, and it's you know, where you can find it, and what its behavior is, and so on. 
and so we wanted to do an art one. It's like a spotter's guide. So like there's a place where you can check boxes if you've seen these works. And um, I wanted to show it to you because most of the publications I've done, and publication is really important as you saw with the comic book. Um, I like them to look like existing publications. So you might, kind of, they, one thing they have an air of familiarity that then gets a little bit um, transform, but also there's a certain amount of confusion that interests me, a certain amount of misreading and misinterpretation. I always find that to be the beginning of interesting thinking, you might say. <clears throat> so um, this is a piece called Yoga Brick Wall that followed some of these other things. This is uh, 500 yoga bricks stacked up very easy to step through or crumble, but sort of imposing nonetheless. And I made a suite of black wind chimes as well. I started making field recordings in art exhibitions and art openings and things like that, I started like bootlegging them um, and then playing that atmospheric that I captured there in a different space. It's kind of like a room tone idea, um, except there was people, like the public is, is sort of on there. They weren't, they didn't work out so great until I went and did the three big minimalism exhibitions in 2004. Um, at MOCA, LACMA, and the Guggenheim, and then play them. They play all simultaneously on the stack of this Judd-like stack of Bose Wave players. And this is a 35 millimeter film called *The Swordsman*. Um, uh, this is a guy named Bob Anderson. It's a sort of a portrait of him, you might say. Came from a story that Christopher Williams told me about. A guy whose job it was was to throw swords on camera from out of out of frame to actors, and uh, he was telling me about this guy, and I said you should make a film of that guy throwing a sword out of cam out out of frame, and he said oh that sounds like your work, why don't you make it? And um, I said okay, put me in touch. And by the time he did, the guy had died, so I. Um, but it didn't go away, so I kept sort of toying with how to do this piece, and I started asking people in the movie industry, who is the sword master? And they all said Bob Anderson. And Bob Anderson is a British guy who handles the fight choreography and stunt work, and, uh, you know, all, so he's, the term is sword master, um, on like everything, like back to Robin Hood, but it, like Barry Lyndon, all the Star Wars films, he was like Darth Vader's stunt double, and the Lord of the Rings movies, and Pirates of the Caribbean movies, and Zorro, and anything involving King Arthur, and you know, all that stuff, he did, he was the guy. And um, I wanted to make this film with him, and I got in touch with him, and he agreed, and um, but he said we have to do it down in Florida, which ended up being really amazingly perfect because he is in this, the, in the background is sort of his retirement community in Florida. And he's sort of being, he's 82, but he's sort of retiring in a certain amount of disgust from the industry because it's become so reliant on computer graphics and martial arts that he, there's, there's not really room for his art anymore. So it's sort of this portrait of a lost instance of the authentic, of, of actual skill and talent. And, um, At the same time, I was making a bunch of works kind of about films. And um, this is a piece called New York, New York, New York, New York. And <clears throat> it's a room you walk into with four video projections on the four walls of the room. And it's it appears to be New York, um, but nobody's there. And um, 
the streets are more or less empty, blah, blah, blah. And it becomes, as you watch, and things like go-kart goes by, or the fruit is fake, or you know, the building is only a facade. You realize these are, are palm trees. You realize that these are um, the, the, New, the New York sound stages in LA. So, and one per wall. So it's Fox, Paramount, Universal, and Culver. And um, I posed as a location scout for like a cell phone commercial or something and went on each set and sort of filmed. And the thing that was really interesting with this work is that people didn't get it. Like it just didn't, an, the punchline never announced itself and a lot of people just, you know, it was reviewed and people didn't get it. <laughs> like, um, this is the facade of, on uh, Dirty Sexy Money, the, the lawyer's law office. FYI. Um, and I became really interested in that delay, that like, um, as a result of this, I was, I, I really became interested in secret work in a way, like degree to which people just will never get it anyway. Here's an art gallery in Soho. Um, on the same subject, I made a, a public work in London in 2005 in Regent's Park as sort of a, a adjunct thing to the Freeze Art Fair. They had a sculpture park and I made a, um, my gallery in New York at that time was packing, he, he occupied these office spaces on the 10th floor of this art building, but he had done well so he was moving to like a ground floor like new digs and um, leaving these two kind of miserable spaces where I had done a show um, behind and I sort of wanted to memorialize them so we made bouncy castles, bounce houses out of them and um, or based on their architecture I should say and put these in, in um, Regent's Park and this was a part of the fair that was open to the public, anybody could enter, bounce around, go crazy. Um, it was very interesting in, in terms of the public. I mean, because since there's no jungle motifs or Spider-Man or anything, it's, it seems to be a sort of a formal work, but there was this um, sort of gap between its functionality and the, you know, the line of people who just want to go in and bounce, who, who cares what it is, and the people who actually wanted to know like what this thing was and um, I'm sure there's more to say about that but I'm gonna move on because there's other stuff um, <clears throat> this was a project where I performed on the wine glasses and made a really professional recording of a very amateur performance on the wine glasses this is like the kind of thing I would do around the dinner table sort of thing. And I decided to really do it. Um, different notes and the whole bit. And um, it was available at an exhibition I did in at the Basel Art Fair. And you could, it was on iPods that you could borrow from the gallery and then walk around the fair and just listen to my wine glass performance. And it was kind of this eerie, atmospheric sounding work which could conceivably isolate you from all the hubbub. And that was the other thing about the bouncy castle. It was sort of supposed to be, it was supposed to kind of actualize the way the gallery packs itself up and takes itself on the road and unfurls again at the new location for the art fair. And then everybody bounces around and has a really good time for two or three days and then um, packs it all up again. And um, The other thing about it is that I really wanted to make something which so much of the work is empty until it's full of people, if you know what I mean. So um, that was something I wanted to kind of actualize. And <clears throat> it's like the graph paper or something. So sort of following on that logic, um, I 
I always, I always kind of like the dumb idea, the bad idea, the thing you shouldn't do because it's so dumb. Um, and this is a film I made called Silent Film of a Tree Falling in the Forest. And I went up to Canada and filmed trees falling in a logging area um, in Alberta. I worked with this logging company who were working in this forest and basically removing this forest. And um, I wanted to make this piece about, again, this idea of, of like the gap between the work and the audience. And whether a work, like this Zen poem, whether a work has any meaning if nobody ever sees it. And so, and then whenever I've kind of shown this work, I've tried to make it kind of difficult, or I've tried to do something with the installation to exacerbate that conundrum, does it? <coughs> does it mean anything? Or if you hear about it, is it the same as seeing it? And stuff like that. So this, these installation shots are at the Whitney Biennial this year. Um, there was a second site that was uh, the Armory Building on Park Avenue, and there's a 30,000 square foot drill hall. It's like the, a Home Depot, essentially. That's just empty. There's the art in front, and then there's this big thing, and then in the back, in a little bunker, if you trek all the way across this couple of football fields, you can find my film. So <clears throat> something kind of interesting to me about, um, you know, for me it was kind of about all the works I'll never make, all the works by other artists I'll never see, whether they still mean anything. And then I did a book called Negative Space, um, which is here. And uh, it had kind of frequently been said about my work that it was about negative space. So I thought I would take it literally, as I often do, and um, take photos of outer space and invert them, meaning make the black white and the white black. And I found the Hubble Space Telescope archive online, copyright free, high resolution. And I basically made this project using that entire archive as inverting it and using it. So it's a book and it's also a set of murals, sort of ongoing, endless set of murals. Um, I sort of, one thing I really liked about this project was how it kind of, it had an autobiographical aspect in the sense that it reminded me in certain ways of a sort of psychedelic Northern California aesthetic and at the same time it reminded me of a kind of spare and evacuated Southern California light and space Michael Asher aesthetic. and. Um, kind of collapsed the two. So um, these are murals. This is in Italy. And they're sort of, so they, so the, the sort of thinking about how um, in outer space the void is black and in the art space the void is always white. The empty room is a white cube. And so this sort of collapses it into so the white of these images becomes the white of the wall of the space. I also made a font called Negative Space, which is online and you can download it and use it. And um, that was a part of that exhibition. It was on, their, on the museum website. And these are a couple other instances. Oh, and that's... Um, a piece called Sky Space Bounce House. It's a bounce house replica of a James Terrell Sky Space. 
is from 2007. So it's very much like a, just like a Terrell, except plus bouncing. Um, and this is the other thing that I did at the Whitney Biennial this year. It's called Coat Check Chimes. So we play that video. You can turn this light off. Can you turn the light off on my face? Please. Thank you. Sounds sort of function in two ways. One when the carousels are going, and the other more like this, just sort of light tinkling when the machines are not going, which is actually most of the time. And it all depended on how busy the museum was, and the weather, and all these sort of chance elements. That's probably the more common wind chiming sound that you were likely to hear. Okay, that's cool. You can turn that off. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> The thing with that work is that it, it sort of bracketed the exhibition. It was the the first thing you saw. If you if you checked the coat, you saw it on your way in and on your way out. And if you didn't, you didn't see it. Um, you might hear it. Can you turn this light out, please? Um, So in that way, it was similar. It was invisible to to some, and um, I liked that it was this uh, basically this musical instrument that was kind of played by the public and the guards, and um, And this was uh, this year. This is that was too. These are both March two thousand eight. Um, this is my <laughs> project Einstein number one. It's a comic book that I made. Um, I sort of got into art through comic books when I was young. I was really into comics, and I wanted to grow up to draw comics. And then in, at a certain point, like maybe as a teenager, I kind of started to feel like I was outgrowing them and 
they were dumb and I sort of got funneled into fine arts or I funneled myself into fine arts and but I always maintain an interest and um, maintain a collection of varying intensities over the years and um, kind of came back to it. So there was obviously that interest in the comic with that chick tract that was like a religious comic. Um, this is a sort of roadrunner treatment of the comic book medium. I sort of um, used my own collection as an archive and drew from it these typologies of spaces from comics. So um, the laboratory or lair or control center or whatever was one sort of typology. The other was the destroyed city and the other was outer space and sort of psychedelic space, microscopic space, mystical, mystical space. And I um, went through and sort of found stuff that I liked and sort of turned it into a narrative and then removed all the people in the text and redrew everything. And, and I did it sort of to industry standard. I, I, it also loops, there's a whole thing, but the drawings that I made look like this. They're um, non-photo blue pencil and ink on these sort of comic book Bristol boards. And then I gave, scanned those and gave them to <coughs> a girl named Emily Warren who works for Marvel Comics and she digitally colored them. So that's those color images you saw were the, were the printed pages. And um, the room of the drawings is kind of like the director's cut or something. And then for 20 bucks, I think you can buy the comic book. So there's usually something in my shows like a CD or like the comic that the, everything has been recorded, the religious tract. And the first show is free. You just um, And the antenna Baldessari was five bucks. There's usually some something that's priced to move in my shows that you can walk away with. So these are my drawings before she got to them. It was sort of this treatise on intelligence and the um, the benefits and disadvantages of having intelligence. <laughs> um, this is a grid of drawings with the title Einstein written in, drawn in every uh, existing comic book title that you could spell Einstein with, or, or almost. You know, like Teen Titans or Frankenstein. And this is here. And there's a sound work uh, in the lobby as well. You can see these speakers uh, bracketing the entrance to the garage and, and the entrance to the garden above. Will you play a uh, track, the first track on that second audio disc, please? So um, I was when I was doing the Negative Space Project, or after I did it, I was thinking about sort of what is the other end, what is the other parenthesis of our sort of uh, the outer envelope of our perception in the other direction, because the Hubble has provided us with the furthest views of the universe that we've ever had. We've, we've learned more about the universe since the Hubble um, went into orbit than we ever had previously, obviously, but I mean, uh, our conception of the age and size of the universe and everything was radically changed. Uh, likewise, the bottom of the ocean is like this huge mystery so um, that we're beginning to explore, but instead of telescopes, we're sort of using, there's a number of ways they do it, but um, one way is microphones. So they drop these microphones down to the bottom and make recordings of sort of these low frequencies of the earth and of the bottom of the ocean, and they can use those for mapping and stuff like that thing is, is you can't, hear, they're so low they can't be heard until they're sped up by computers 16 times. And in one of the texts I was reading, somebody mentioned, yeah, and whales sound like birds at that speed. So I got a bunch of new age hum, humpback whale recordings and sped them up 16 times. 
and that's what you're hearing. And then I got a bunch of birdsong records, like relaxation birdsong records. And we played track two and slowed them down 16 times. And one is by the garden, the, the birds are by the garden, and the um, whales are by the parking garage. And the plan is to make a vinyl record with one with the birds on one side and the whales on the other. And this is recent and a, um, I thought a good place to stop. So that's it. So um, I'm happy to take your questions if you have any. Okay. I think someone has a microphone if you want to ask a question. Hi. I was just wondering, um, on the benches that you did with the benches, were those like, were those actual benches? Like, did you go through the city or whatever and yeah. get your, okay, and you had those on there. But then you also had them inside the, um, your gallery. No. No, okay, I thought you Yeah, said no, there was only, the, inside the gallery I think was posters and uh, the audio playing on the speakers, and out in the world were benches. Were the benches, okay. So and that was, was that more of like... Um, were you actually trying to advertise for it, or yeah, was your art yeah, or both? I mean, kind of? I was actually interested interested to see what would happen if you put out if you put art out into the same marketplace as films and music and stuff. Does it can it survive? And the answer is pretty much no. But <laughs> um, but yeah, people. It says available now at Margot Levin Gallery, and people call and say, "I'm interested in this new Bob Dylan record." Um, and like I, I said, this kind of misinterpretation, this kind of confusion is really interesting to me. But it's also, and maybe it's kind of a hassle for the person who thought they were going to get a Dylan record or maybe even the gallery, but I kind of think that's a really interesting conversation that happens over the phone in that moment where the person is like, where, where the person who works at the gallery has to say, well, actually it's an artwork, and it's just the applause, and it's $20, da da da, -da. And then, you know, oh, cool, or, oh. You know, whatever. I mean, right. I, that to me is an interesting mm, collision. Definitely. Thanks.